Um, you need to get in contact with me. I'm david.stokesoracle.com. At Twitter, I'm at Stoker, but I gotta warn you, there's a new independent movie out starring Nicole Kidman. And the name of the movie is Stoker. So if you see tweets about Stoker being Nicole Kidman's greatest work, um, please disregard that. You're not that much. <sighs> Too tiny. Oracle makes everyone who talks about Oracle products from Oracle include this in the slides. It's basically, if I talk about something that's brand new, uh, take it with a grain of salt. I might say it's blue, and you're thinking sky blue, and I'm thinking cerulean blue. Uh, until it's been out and released for a while, take it with a grain of salt on new products. I don't know how many of you saw this. Uh, it happened in Brigham Women's Hospital, not too far from here. Now here's a gentleman shaking his head. A bunch of radiologists, people who are used to looking at CAT scans and radiology slides and x-rays, were asked to identify abnormalities in slides. And usually they're little cases or little pinpricks or little black dots. Well, these guys, doing the study, decided what they do is they put pictures of a gorilla in the slides, Photoshop them in there. Well, they couldn't even do that. They didn't have a picture of a gorilla, so they got a picture of a friend of theirs in a gorilla suit and put them in a set of 10 slides. Why is it always people in grow suits in these studies? I don't know. We need a society to protect people in the grow suits. So, this slide pops up. The radiologists don't notice the picture of the guy in the grow suit waving. 83% of the trained radiologists, a group that in the medical field knows, has a very narrow failure rate. They're usually right on top of things. 83% of them couldn't find a picture of a gorilla in one of the slides. Um, the gorillas had their own response, of course. So why did I bring that up? Well, we have a big shortage of DBAs in the MySQL world. I get between five and ten calls, emails, LinkedIn messages from recruiters, bosses, engineers looking for trained MySQL DBAs. Very hard to find, very expensive, very rare. And they're offering money for me to find them for them. Fortunately, I can't find enough to do it. So what I'm trying to do is go around and convince Linux and Unix admins to run databases. Unfortunately, databases are a little different than any other service you'll run on a Unix box or a Linux box. Um, other services you run on a Linux box, you can double up on. They're fairly simple, fairly benign, and often do that. Uh, databases are kind of like the little rotten, misbegotten children of the service world. Also, what happens when a project starts out is they decide they need a data, someone decides they need a database service, and they go and grab Margaret's old machine from accounting, the one that was running Windows ME, put Slackware on it and then drop it in MySQL and hope it lasts for the 20 years of the project. Now it's fairly easy to get a MySQL database running and with fairly decent performance. Uh, with a little bit of luck and a little bit of reading, just about anyone can get the box about 80% performance level. The last 20% is really, really, really tricky. So this is a quick Overview of what we're going to cover. So, what does a database server really do? Well, on the slide on the left, you see that someone has actually written something in structured query language that says they want the phone number from a table named Friends where there's someone named Joe. So, the client sends that off to the server. The server parses that and makes sure that it's valid SQL. And then says, okay, go out to find Joe in the friends table that's sitting in memory. And then return the phone number. At that time, it returns the phone number to the client. Those of you who are awake will say, well, what was that about memory? Databases love data in memory. Most DBAs fight to keep their most important data in memory. So corollary number one, your big nightmare is you're going to be keeping things in memory and getting them off disk. So, what if it's not in memory? Well, once again, we want to know, uh, just 
case, the data from the city table. So the client, so the database goes out and asks the operating system, can you load up the inode for that table, go through and pull the data from that inode in, from the disk, put it into memory, hand off that buffer to me, and I'll load it into my memory. Much, much, much slower process. So rule number two, databases do a lot of unpredictable I.O. Make sure you have good disks and good I.O. channels. So once again, what happens when you read that file in the memory? Well, it takes about 100 nanoseconds to take it from buffer to page cache, and off you go. Now if it's out on disk, it takes 10 milliseconds. 100 times, 100,000 times slower. Uh, my favorite example up here is 100,000 minutes is 70 days. So imagine your boss asks for something right now and you tell them, yeah, you can have it in 69.5 days. So hardware-wise, uh, the old standard was you put caches on everything. And there's two types of caches, both like you. There's the right back cache, which as soon as you send something to it, it says, okay, uh, go ahead, I've got the data. And there's the write-through cache, as soon as you send it to it, it pushes it through. Uh, that's the way it's supposed to work. Uh, a lot of times I go to a customer site and they have write-through, uh, both the controller and the disk. Works fairly well. If you have the money or a little bit better hardware, try to do write-back on the controller and write-through on the disk drive. It makes things a little bit uh, faster. A little bit more reliable. Solid state disks. Two years ago, when I started giving this talk, they were just kind of floating into the market. How many folks here are using solid state disks in production? Okay. How happy are you with them? Very good. Very good. Uh, three years from now, I'm feeling that everything will be a solid state disk, and people look at me when I talk about old platter disks like the do when I mentioned my four inch or my five and a quarter inch floppy, my niche. Who floppies? So, if you're starting from scratch, or you get to pick your own hardware, um, get memory, lots of it, error correcting as best as you can. Disks, the more spindles, the better. The more you separa separate out the I.O. channels, the better the data flows between the various pieces, like for logs and data files. Uh, do not use the XT2 or 3, those of you who are stuck with older releases. Go to something like PFS. XFS, the XT4, there's actually a uh, programming problem in the XT2 and 3 that blocks your writes. Record caches with battery backups. And make sure that your battery lifespan is greater than the span that you need to get hardware service out. The battery backup keeps your data alive, but it keeps the data alive and your Terms of service with your vendor are eight hours, and you only have two hours of battery backup. Um, might, as well, might as well have the battery backup. CPUs. Um, you're better off spending money on better I.O. than having the latest and greatest CPU. Until 5.6, my skill really didn't scale past a dozen cores very well. Now we do 48 very, very well. This is a big warning for Linux admins. The MySQL security is a little bit uh, primitive, is probably the proper word. We've changed this a bit in 5.6, and so I'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, basically, when you authenticate, you send a command over, you send a, you're sending your user account name, a password, and a host name. First thing MySQL does is it checks to make sure the host is on the whitelist to let you in. Then after that, it checks the username, and then it checks the network address. Now, or I mean password. Now, the trouble with MySQL is that it's a table where you have multiple entries for the same name and have different value, values in the host field. So, Joe at 192.168.1.15, which is your boss's address in the office, will be different than Joe at 
food bar top that. Now the way you'll find this out is your boss will take home the performance reviews the day before they're due and be working from home and not be able to get to the data that he needs very badly to do your performance review. Okay. Uh, big hint, no matter how well your organization is, do not make the root password for your database the same as you on your Linux boxes. So you don't appear shaking your head like you suffered with that before. Uh, like I said, the, the MySQL security is a little bit primitive, and you don't want uh, Joe from accounting who just happened to copy somebody's post it note folder on your database and dropping your tables for you. Okay, you're starting from scratch, you want to build up MySQL on a box, what do you do? Well, you can go with the version that your distro has. Well, that's great, sometimes they're lagging, they're a little slow, the poor volunteer has 18 other things to do, and the software is quite there. What I recommend is you go out to MySQL.com and download the latest package for your system. Uh, the other thing is, don't run unless you absolutely have to run MySQL or any other database with any other service out there. Uh, the database is a nasty animal. It's like a cow bird. It will push everything else off and some of your box starts swapping at the wrong time. I tell 5.6 configuration files. Yes, sir. When you say don't double up or don't run with other services, what kind of setting, you know, uh, not only really is the back end to, uh, you know, a website or you know, a patch. So that's not a different server. So, yeah. I like to have everything in separate boxes. Um, in development, you can get away with it. In production, uh, what happens is you get the Apache server on there, and someone changes the configuration to have 100,000 threads out there. And then someone also drops the LDAP server on there. And next thing you know, your database starts chunking away. And everyone starts I mean, I, I run a small site out of my house, you know, yeah. my own personal site. But I'm setting it up so that I really have a MySQL backend mm -hmm. to store stuff and make it accessible to the site. Yeah. And I don't, I'm not in a position to run, you know, half a dozen boxes. Well, you could have had enough Raspberry Pis and electricity. <laughs> <laughs> but this is kind of a general hint for if you're running a business or you're running a project commercial and you really need that database speed. Uh, Oh, box, you probably, you know, your, your brother could probably wait 15 seconds to get the bowling league updates, you know, on, on a uh, quick click website where they're selling stuff, you know, people are going to go to the next page if they don't get immediate response. With MySQL, before 5.6, our configuration files didn't age well. A large box was considered 6 gigs of memory. Five to six that changes a little bit. Uh, Sherry has a wonderful podcast about that that just came out on the depreciated values. Talk a little bit about that in a minute. What they can move your log files to different disk drives than your data files. They will contend with each other. Better yet, have them on different disk controllers. Also, if you spread your data over different drives. So you have your more popular databases on various drives. And backups. There's a wonderful session coming up in 45 minutes on backups that you should attend. Backups are necessary. Replication does not count as a backup. The other big caveat with backups is that unless you know how to restore an entire database, a table, or a row from a table from your backup, if you do it fairly quickly, it's not really a backup, it's just wasting data. Okay, you want to monitor your box. The first thing that you should probably do is turn on the slow query log. This is a option in the configuration file that you set up. And you say, okay, I want to see every query that takes longer than X amount of time. And you can predetermine that X amount of time. Well, why do you want to know this? Well, you want to know what queries are going through slowly through your system. If there's something you can optimize to increase, uh, it's not going to talk about optimizing queries, but you want to go through and find the ones that are really slow and take care of them. 
not every flow query is a bad query. The query has to go through all the customer tables and pull up all 15 million customers that you have on your list is necessarily going to be slow. And as a DBA, you have to learn to differentiate between the ones that are just poorly optimized and the ones that are just going to have to slog through the system. Also, you have an option to log queries that are not using indexes. We'll go into indexes in a little bit later. Also, I recommend everyone use some sort of monitoring software. I highly recommend MySQL Enterprise Monitor. There's a whole bunch of other tools, Cacti, Nagios, uh, Moon, some commercial, some free. But you need something to keep an eye on your box when you're not keeping an eye on the box. Otherwise, you're never going to have a vacation, you're never going to have a weekend. Just remember, if you can't see all your problems, it doesn't mean it can't see all of you. We'll go into a little bit more on that in the tuning. Backups. Usually in the MySQL world, you have two types of backups. One's the serialization of your data out to a file, and the other one is an LVM snapshot. Now, which one do I recommend? I recommend both. If you have the time and the space and the ability to do both. Uh, the more you have, the better you are to recover. You'll have to negotiate with your boss how much data can you lose. Once again, how much data can you lose and negotiate that with your boss. One thing I would highly recommend, is, even for small shops, is get a smaller order box, put it off to the side, and run MySQL replication to it. A MySQL replication is <laughs> Not a big adventure in systems, it's more of an exercise in typing. Anyone here can probably do it in under 10 minutes the first time and get it going. It's simple. Make a copy of your master onto the slave, shut down the IELTS thread on the slave, and make a copy of the slave. Therefore, you have a copy of everything on the master, and away you go. Also, especially for you younger folks out here, be paranoid. Whatever you think can go wrong, will go wrong. Once again, right before the time, your boss does it. Well, how does MySQL replication work? Master has its tables. Slave has a copy of those tables. If something changes on the master, it's written out to a binary log. Slave comes by, sucks down a copy of that change, and applies it to its own copy of the data. We have two type, types in MySQL. A synchronous, which has been around for several releases. Basically what happens is the master makes it available and off it goes, doesn't care if any of the slaves actually has a copy of the data, it's just happy it's made the change available for the slaves. Semi-synchronous, the server actually makes sure that at least one of the slaves acknowledges that it has a copy of the data. The slave may not have actually put it out there on its copy of the information, but it has a copy of the changes and is ready to apply that. If things go bad with my store application, and you're running semi-synchronous, it will default back to asynchronous. Right now, unless you're running 5.6, your threading is for replication single-threaded. With my go 5.6, it's multi-threaded for a database. It means before now, replication was fairly messy. Also, if things died, you ended up looking at the binary log files and figuring out the offsets and having to move things around and edit files and do a whole bunch of nasty stuff to get everything to line up between the slaves and the master. Now with 5.6, we have something called global transaction IDs. Every server has a unique ID, the slaves and the master, and every transaction has a unique ID. So the slaves now come through and sees, oh, I've got transaction 5.6.7, I already done that one, I don't have to worry about it. Oh, there comes 454, I haven't done that one, I need to apply it. So in the old days, you had to play with a whole bunch of monitoring log files and make a whole bunch of, uh, well, cut and paste of logical, cut and paste to get things synced up. No, no longer. Okay, on replication, please try to keep your slaves on a uh, good home run to the master. Otherwise, you'll notice that uh, things will start lagging. When I go to customer sites and they tell me, oh yeah, our slave it runs 15 minutes behind the master, and you start asking why, and then you look at the network 
topology, and the slave is in the rack next to the master, but the wiring is through di two different hubs, five different switches, and a <coughs> Now, slaves generally do not need to be as fast as the master. So try to keep it reasonable. <coughs> With MySQL 5.6, we now have some utilities that are written in Python that will let you designate a master and a whole bunch of slaves. And if the master goes down, the slaves will figure out which one is the most up-to-date. Automatically kick over and start running your, your data without any downtime. That's the case where you want to have the master hardware the same as the slave hardware. Also, you do not have to replicate everything. Uh, we haven't added a state to this country in 60 some odd years, so if you have a table, it's nothing but straight codes and abbreviations. Um, that's probably not as critical as your customer information. This is a fairly typical use of replication. On the left, we have a master that mainly handles rights. We have two other slaves that handle reads for a web application. And the master can be set up with a load balancer on the front end or some application tricks to handle a couple reads. But the idea is you take your write loads away from your read load. Indexes. A table full of data is kind of like a little card catalog. If you don't know what you're looking for, you have to start at the beginning and go all the way through. With an index, especially a unique index, every record has a unique identifier and you can say, okay, I want that one. If you don't have that, you have to search from A to Z. So if you're trying to figure out what the plural of the word moose is, and your dictionary doesn't have things in a, in a sorted order, and you don't know where the moose entry is, you have to start with the first one and reach the last one. Anyone here know what the plural of moose is? Yes, sir. Moose. Correct. So you've doubled your knowledge today just by showing up. Uh, so the analog here is when you have the unique index, you go right to that record rather than having to, to trust through all the file. Bad trouble with indexes is they're not a panacea. You have some maintenance and then take up space. So every time you insert something, you're going to have to put in an entry into the index. If you delete something, you have to pull that entry on the index. It's a little bit of extra overhead. If you have to go through everything, like all the customer files, and you have 15 million of them, and you have to go from Mr. Aronson to Mr. Zebra, you're going to read everything anyway, and in that case, the index is not going to help you. Now, you can do composite indexes, which is multiple columns into an index. The uh, most popular one you see is the year, month, day, which means you can search for a record on year, month, day, or year, month, or year from one index. Okay, so you've got your box set up. You're using the latest and greatest software. How do you get things running at about 80% efficiency? First, use InnoDB. And I recommend setting your InnoDB InnoDB buffer pool size to 70 to 80 percent of memory. And then for most folks, I say, okay, walk away. Let it run for a while. Make sure you're using a good file system. If you are, <coughs> if you have data that you work in groups like a month or a quarter or a year, partition your data into that with a smaller chunk. So worst case comes to worst, and all that has to be run into memory after a shutdown. It's uh, a smaller piece of pie in the middle. Also, here's the rough one. Architecture data. Uh, often on projects that I run into or open source code that I see, it's obvious the original core developers had a brand theme. And then you look at the far end of the table, and it's obvious that some other guy came in, oh, I need this field, I need this field. Oh, I need the data for these two fields put in this field. And you see stuff like that all the time. Architect your data and keep it that way. Third uh, normal form if you can. Also, once again, go through your SQL statements. I uh, wish I had the demo here. Our SEs have a wonderful demo where they're running MySQL Enterprise Monitor. 
and somebody do a big blip on this display of traffic going through. They highlight the blip and it'll actually pull a piece of Java code that's causing problems on a server. So you can actually go back to the Java programmer and show them what they're doing wrong. Don't hurt yourself. Great backup controllers. Sometimes they have a learning phase, which basically means they turn off the, the buffering and they also tend to slow down a lot. And if you don't have a way of figuring this, when will it happen? Friday morning when they're running payroll. Uh, if you can't control it, set it up on a quiet time, uh, weekends, uh, early morning when you know nothing's running in a batch mode. Also go through your queries and seek to optimize your most frequent queries. Something that runs 100,000 times a day, it's better to take two tenths of a second out of that than the one, re one request your boss runs on a quarterly basis that takes four hours. Also keep on track of MySQL upgrades. 5.5 was 20% faster than 5.1. By the way, those of you who did 5.0 to 5.1 upgrade, that was kind of an arduous battle. 5.1 to 5.5 is almost non-thrilling. 5.5 to 5.6 is also kind of boring, which is a good for software upgrade. Okay, now you got your machine running 80%, how do you get past 80% into 90, 95, approaching 100%? Well, part of that depends on your data. The stuff that works for Facebook works for Facebook, will work for you. Uh, there's lots of tuning help available. Uh, two books that I recommend are the third edition of High Performance by SQL. Make sure it's the third edition. Second edition is not as thorough and on sale to local parts of Nova. Uh, the other one, uh, the MySQL Administrator Bible. Uh, if you talk to the authoress, she might be able to get you a discount. Uh, there's also a series of books by Ronald Bradford called Effective MySQL. There are about 100, 110 pages on the subject. Uh, query optimization, uh, backup, replication, uh, no fluff, they're nice little easy reads that are very thorough. Also something I recommend is the weekly RSQL podcast. The Oracle Technical Network sponsors that and uh, two very talented DBAs come up with interesting subjects and they cover them for 10 to 15 minutes. They're available on the Apple Store or you can listen to them from their website which is rsql.com and if you're really nice to Sherry up here, she might be able to get, get you a copy of the CDs of the previous version. <laughs> um, there's also a forum on forums at MySQL.com dedicated to performance. Uh, if you think you're good, uh, go out there and try to answer every question for a week out there. There are some weird stuff going on that you've never thought of that people do. And it's good to uh, see what's Also, read the aggregated blogs at planet.mysql.com. If you want to see what's going on out there with Ben Log commits, what people are trying to do with various new features of MySQL 5.6, or how they're debugging other problems they're running into, it's a great read. Also, if you're a programmer or an admin and you're having trouble, go out and borrow or buy a skilled MySQL DBA. Sometimes a couple hours of consulting will save you hours and hours and hours later. By the way, that's a uh, good definition I've found for DBA as possible. Um, there is a place in the world for anal retentive people, and it is called DBA. <laughs> um, <coughs> now, you're lucky in this area that you have an outstanding MySQL users group. Uh, it's Boston MySQL dot Yeah, MySQL boss, I think. MySQL boss. Um, they meet monthly. They're a very good group. They're very friendly and they network very well. Also, if you know someone who wants to learn MySQL or you want to get your MySQL shop better, on April 15th they're running their second edition of what they call MySQL Marinade. What that is is a virtual online free class where you work through a rally learning MySQL book one chapter a week, and you upload your homework on GitHub. And if you have problems, there's people out there to help you. When 
again, it's free, virtual, it's online, and it's very, very well done. So, uh, big hit from someone who's been trying to get computers to do what he's wanted for 35 years. Uh, seek to optimize your system as a whole. The common cry in a lot of development shops is it must be the database's problem because that's the part that we programmers don't control, so therefore that has to be the root of all evil. Um, <coughs> if you can, go out and profile what the entire system does. Know how long it takes from someone registering at your website to placing that first catalog order and checking does. Know the flow process and see where you can optimize it. And some last minute events for the uh, intermediates in the audience. Uh, a lot of projects, open source projects, do select asterisk, which is a wild card saying, give me everything from a table. Uh, that works well when you have one or two columns in a table, but over time, it goes to you know, three, four, five hundred columns in a table. You're wasting bandwidth, you're wasting memory, uh, you're wasting disk IOs. Select only what you need for speed. Learn to use the explain command. You can send that into a, on an SQL statement and it will tell you what the optimizer wants to do to run that query. You can see if it's using the, the indexes you want and if it's doing some other nasty stuff out there like trying to do file sorts through the operating system rather than trying to sort it in memory. You use benchmark, set benchmark time. So if someone says, gee, the database runs slow. Well, you need some sort of empirical data. You know, what's, it's taking five seconds now. It usually takes seven seconds. It's actually not the database is slow. Something else is going on. Smallest possible data type for fields. The more you pack your data, the better it is for speed. Uh, those of you who run WordPress, every integer is a big int, which is like 17 trillion. I don't think anyone, no matter how dedicated they are, is ever going to run into 17 trillion posts on a single blog. Also in the past, we used to tell people to rewrite subqueries into joins with MySQL. The big joke was that MySQL didn't do subqueries and Postgres didn't do joins. Uh, they do joins fairly well right now and in the classic, they do subqueries very well. On the MySQL data side, pay attention to the updates. When we put out updates, they're for a reason. Also, usually, like I said, 5.1 to 5.5 is 20% five, faster, 5.5 five, five, to 5.6 five, another 20%. For those of you who like to travel and your bosses are going out to MySQL, going out to Oracle Open World, see if you tag along. We have our own event called MySQL Connect. On uh, Saturday and Sunday, we're having technical talks from a lot of our engineers. We have a couple of beginner's talks, but most of it's going to be on the high end. So if you want to have an immediate account check, tell you how to benchmark, or you want Mark Lee to tell you how to review the new performance schema, this is the day to be there. And then on Monday, at Moscone Center, we're going to have at least eight, possibly as many as 16 tutorials on advanced subjects. So if you are a serious DBA, or you want to be, this is the place to be in September. Oh, and if you want to get a free ticket to it, uh, submit a paper and get it accepted. Uh, once again, my school marinade, marinade, wonderful self-study group. Uh, how, how far away are people as far as? We have people in Europe and whatnot and yeah. you know, definitely on the West Coast. And yeah. And you folks are lucky, so if you really have a problem, come to the local group. Q&A Nothing? Actually, I'm curious. I, is it worth putting no, no cash on queries or something that we're going to use again? Um, query cash. Query cash. This is this kind of down to a, almost a religious argument. Um, our engineers are now in the position of saying, you know, unless you know you're going to run that query 800 times an hour, turn off query cache. So. And there's actually a mode in query cache where you can set it to on demand. So there's three modes. There's on, off, and it's off by default in 5.6 actually. 
and then there's on demand. And with on demand, you can put something in the query. So you say select SQL cache, and that will actually cache only that query. Um, you still have the overhead of every query that will look for a cache result if you do that. But if you know that there's a query that you want to cache, you can, and you don't want to use something like memcached or anything that's actually made for caching, you can do that. Um, but yeah, by default, you should turn it off unless you can know for sure that, you, that it's worth it. <coughs> and the, the other recommendation, if you know you have to run that 4,800 times, it should be in your application. The information should be somewhere in the memory of your application. Well, you're a quiet bunch. We're new. We don't know what to ask you. Oh. <laughs> well, I thought you were trying to crowd us all upside down by the old Union Oyster House. So we can get into the parts and... Well, thank you all for coming out. Oh, yes, sir. Oh, I was going to ask, how's uh, Butter Pest progressing towards something you can use my signal on? Um, I know early on there were issues with it, but in terms of performance. Uh, last time I talked to the Butter folks was last September. And they're telling me they're almost there. Um, but I haven't been around with Linux panel developers for decades now. Tell me it's almost there. I'm not quite sure. Uh, on paper, it looks like it's going to be wonderful. Uh, meanwhile, folks I know are running XFS4 and DFS and waiting for the beta drop, hoping that it comes through that delivery for problems. Well, thank you all for coming out. If you have any questions, let me know.